I think I think we should differentiate three projects, which uh, uh, are not are, are, seem to me to be easily conflated and are, are and are are distinct and, and independently worthy endeavors. Um, the first project, with respect to morality, is we could understand what people do in the name of, quote, morality. And we could look at the world, we could see all of these diverse behaviors and, and rules and cultural artifacts and, and morally salient emotions like empathy and disgust. Um, and we could see how this plays out in human communities uh, in our time and, and in history. And we could look at all that in a, as non-judgmental a way as possible and seek to understand it and seek to understand it in, in evolutionary terms, and seek to understand it in psychological and neurobiological terms as it arises in the present. Um, and we can call that complete set of data and that whole effort to be a science of morality. Uh, and that's a purely descriptive science of the sort that I hear Jonathan uh, advocating and as, you know, as he's practicing. And that seems to me, for most scientists, uh, to pretty much exhaust all the legitimate points of contact between science and morality and science and, and judgments of good and evil and right and wrong. Um, but I think there are two other projects that we could concern ourselves with and, and uh, are arguably more important uh, than that. And, the, and the, the second project would be to actually get clearer about what we mean and should mean by the term morality. Uh, and how it relates to human well-being altogether, and actually uh, use that new discipline to think more intelligently about how to maximize human well-being. Uh, now, philosophers may think that that's begging some of the important questions, uh, and I'll get back to that, but I think that's, that's a distinct project. It's not a purely descriptive project. It's a, a normative project. How can we think about moral truth uh, uh, in, in the context of science? Uh, and a third project is, we, uh, is a, a project of, of persuasion. How can we persuade all of the people who are committed to silly and harmful things in the name of, quote, morality to change their commitments, to have different goals, to have different uh, objectives in life, and to lead better lives? Uh, and that, I think that third project is actually the most important project facing humanity at this moment. And I think it actually subsumes everything else we could care about from stopping climate change to stopping nuclear proliferation to curing cancer to saving the whales, any, any, any big effort that, that requires that we get our priorities straight and marshal massive uh, commitments of time and resources can fall within, the, with this, within this project of, of uh, all of us converging on uh, the same kinds of economic and political and uh, environmental goals. And, I, and it seems to me that obviously that, that project of persuasion is a very difficult task, uh, but it strikes me as especially difficult if you can't figure out in what sense anyone could ever be right and wrong about questions of morality and questions of value. Uh, and so that's project, the, the right and wrong part is project two, and that's what I'm focused on. Um, now, there have been impediments uh, to focusing on Project 2, and uh, the main one being that most right-thinking people, most well-educated people, most well-intentioned people, certainly most scientists and public intellectuals, and I would think most journalists, um, uh, have been convinced that something in the last 200 years of intellectual progress has made it impossible to actually talk about moral truth. That there is, there, there is no, and this is not because uh, human experience is so difficult to study or the brain is so complex, but just that there's no intellectual basis from which to say anyone is, is ever right or wrong about questions of, of good and evil and, and uh, human value. Um, so my interest is in, in trying to uh, undermine that intuition. I think, I think that intuition is, is, is born now of uh, uh, it's kind of the received opinion in science and philosophy. And I, I think it's, it's based on a lot of fallacies and double standards and um, uh, frankly bad philosophy that has gotten us to this point. Um, 
And the first thing I, I would point out is that we have, um, one thing I should, I should just point out is that this has consequences. I mean, so for instance, one signature moment where this, this bias against a Project 2 would, would be expressed was when, um, in 1947, when the United Nations was trying to formulate its, its Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the, um, the American Anthropological Association stepped forward and said, well, you, you, you can't do this. I mean, to, to, to do this would be to merely be foisting one provincial notion of human rights on the rest of human culture, and any notion of human rights is the product of, of culture, and this is just an intellectually illegitimate thing to do. And this is, what, you know, this is 1947. This is essentially the best our social sciences could do with the crematory of Auschwitz still smoking. You know, and yet it's been long, long been obvious that we need some to converge as a global civilization on, on how to behave and how to treat one another. We need some universal conception of, of uh, right and wrong. Uh, so this, in addition to just not being true, I think the skepticism about moral truth actually has consequences that we, we really should worry about. Um, so one thing to observe is that definitions matter and we in, the, in, in science are always in the business of framing conversations, making definitions, uh, and there's nothing about that process that gives us epistemological relativism, that, 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 that nullifies truth claims. So in physics, we define physics as, you know, loosely speaking, our best effort to understand the behavior of matter and energy in the universe. Uh, so it's defined with respect to the goal of understanding how matter is going to behave. Now, anyone else is free to define physics in some other way. I mean, the, the, you know, a, a creationist physicist could come into the room and say, well, you know, that's not my definition of physics. I want my physics, I want, I want to simply match the book of Genesis. Uh, and we are free to exclude that person and say, well, you, know, you really don't belong at this conference. That's not physics as, as we are interested in it. Um, you're using the word differently, you're not playing our language game. That, that gesture of exclusion, in no sense, the, the fact that the discourse of physics is not sufficient to silence that guy, that that, 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 that that person can't be brought into the conversation, doesn't nullify physics as a domain of, of right and wrong answers. Uh, and yet, on the subject of morality, we seem to think that the possibility of differing opinions the fact, the fact that someone can come forward and say, well, no, my morality has nothing to do with human flourishing. It has to do with following, you know, Sharia law. The fact that that position can be articulated, I hear people like Jonathan and certainly many philosophers saying, well, that proves in some sense that there's no there there. This is all made up. This is not, we can't, uh, the fact that you can articulate a different position is a, is a problem for the whole field. And I think it's not. So I think, uh, I think, we have, um, obviously we have an intuitive physics, and much of our intuitive physics is wrong with respect to, to the goal of understanding how matter and energy are going to behave in the universe. I'm, what I want to say is that mo most people, most of us, most cultures have an intuitive morality. And much of our intuitive morality may be wrong with respect to the goal of maximizing human flourishing. Uh, and that, uh, uh, and maximizing the well-being of conscious creatures generally. And so what I'm going to argue to you briefly is that the only, the only sphere of legitimate moral concern, really, when you get into the details, is the well-being of conscious creatures. Uh, and um, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words in defense of that assertion, but uh, I think actually that the, our sense that that has to be defended is, is uh, the product of uh, some uh, fallacious moves and double standards that we're not noticing. And I, I don't know that I have the time to, to uh, expose all of those, but um, I've introduced two things. I've introduced the concept of consciousness and the concept of well-being. So, the, so briefly, consciousness is the only context in which we can talk about value and morality and right and wrong and good and evil. Um, why is that not an arbitrary starting point? Well, what, what's the alternative? I mean, just imagine someone coming forward and saying, um, actually, I have this, this other source of value which has nothing to do with the actual or potential experience of conscious beings. You know, this is, this is, this is something that cannot affect 
the experience of anything in this life or in any future life. Well, I mean, if you, you put that thing in a box, what I think you have in that box is, by definition, the least interesting thing in the universe. I mean, it's, it's something by definition we cannot care about. Anything else that is going to be a source of value is going to have some relationship to the experience of conscious being. So I, I don't think consciousness is, a, is a, an arbitrary starting point. I mean, we are ta when we're talking about morality, when we're talking about right and wrong and good and evil and outcomes that matter, we are talking about changes in consciousness. Um, and so I would add to that that well-being is captures uh, everything we could care about in, in the moral sphere. And then the task is, just, is to, to have a definition of well-being that is truly open-ended and can absorb everything we care about. So, and this is why I don't call myself a consequentialist or, or a utilitarian, because traditionally 